Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight, is Francesca Leah Block. She is a kind of writer who makes other writers envious. She's young and sassy and already has more than 25 books to her credit. And it's not just the volume of books, it's that the New York Times says that she writes about the real Los Angeles better than anyone since Raymond Chandler. Raymond Chandler, the legendary Raymond Chandler. The Huffington Post called her book, The Elements, And I'm quoting here, stunning and intoxicating. I've always wanted to intoxicate people with my writing. And Francesca has done it. We're going to find out how she does that. Time Out New York called her book, The Necklace, or it's just called Necklace of Kisses, a fizzy cocktail of Joseph Campbell, Sex in the City, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez filtered through the blunt edge poetry of rock lyrics. Wow. Joseph Campbell, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Nobel Prize winner, and so on. So besides being the author of uh, more than 25 books, and these books are books of fiction, nonfiction, short stories, poetry. She's also written screenplay adaptations of her work. She's received several awards, including the Spectrum Award, the Phoenix Award, the ALA Rainbow Award, uh, and the 20... 2005, I should say, Margaret A. Edwards Lifetime Achievement Award. She, uh, her work has been translated into numerous languages, including Italian, French, German, Spanish, Japanese, Norwegian, Portuguese, and others. She's been named the writer in residence at Pasadena City College. That was in 2014. And in 2018 through 2019, she became a visiting assistant professor in creative writing at the University of Redlands. Currently, she teaches fiction at UCLA Extension, Antioch University, and also teaches privately in Los Angeles, where she was born and raised. Francesca Leah Block, welcome to Novelist Spotlight. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Well, you know, it's an honor. I mean, all these all these uh, accolades that you received, all this work you produced. You know, you sound like an obsessive writer, and uh, those are the best kind of writers, the kind of per- person who actually, um, if you stop writing, it's like stopping breathing. I'm not sure I'll survive. Yeah. Um, but let me let me ask you what obsesses you. I mean, does writing obsess you, and what about writing obsesses you, if, if that is the case? Yes, I would definitely use that word. Since I was very young, since I could pick up a pen, I think I was, I felt that way. I find it extremely cathartic as well as a way to connect to other people and to possibly give them something um, also cathartic through that. So that's my basic core belief about it. And then many of the other things I'm obsessed with are filtered in through that as well. Other art forms, for example. You know, you've written too many books for me to know the answer to this question, but how does living in Los Angeles influence your sensibilities? Um, Well, actually, let me back up a minute. But I really want to ask you before getting to that is, do you consider yourself an L.A. writer? Again, because you've written so many books, I'm not familiar with, with nearly all of them. But, uh, you know, you were cited in that uh, New York Times review as writing about L.A. better than anybody since Raymond Chandler. Uh, Do you consider yourself an L.A. writer? Yes, I'm proud to be an L.A. writer. I was born here, as you said. My uh, my parents were from New York, but and I do have some of that. But I feel very strongly that my obsessions to bring it back to your question, you know, have revolve around the jacaranda trees and the bougainvillea and the mix of dreams and shattered dreams and so many things about LA that I love the pink smog sunsets you know all of it so yes I I'm I don't like to be put in categories necessarily in other ways but 
as far as being an L.A. writer, I'll wear that proudly. Well, what does it mean to be an L.A. writer? Uh, how would you define that? That's interesting. I mean, I have writers that I admire in that category. Of course, Chandler, also Joan Didion, Eve Babbitt. Uh, I would say, you know, so many contemporary current writers as well. Janet Fitch, um, so many people that I that whose work I love. And I think it's it's just the deep inspiration of this place and, and a different sensibility than the East Coast, which has dominated publishing in the past. How would you, what would you say? How would you define it? Well, I think I would, uh, having lived there, uh, having lived in Pasadena and spent time in, in uh, Los Angeles, and every time I go visit, it's, it's got, I, I always think in terms of somebody who is not only referring to the locations, the, the highways, the byways, the locations, the restaurants, the um, various attractions, but also somebody who's writing embodies the L.A. ethos. Mm. And that's a big, that's a big, I mean, what is the L.A. ethos? When you think about it, Los Angeles is so, it's such a sprawling city, but it's not just sprawling geographically, it's sprawling in terms of the people who comprise its population yeah. and, yes. and the industries that are there. You have everything from aerospace to Hollywood, the movie business, and uh, it's become Silicon Beach down there. There's there's that yeah. part of L.A. that is now full of technology companies. And you see so many people who are very much part of that whole groove, the kind of the Sunset Strip, uh, yeah. cool um, people who show up there. And it's also just, just a, a land of dreams. There are, I'll never forget when I got off the plane in Los Angeles mm -hmm. this one time. I was just returning home to L.A., but I saw some gal and she was walking through the airport and she was with a friend, I think, or somebody was meeting her. She was all excited about being in L.A. She had obviously never been there before. I don't know where she was from, if she was from another country or she was from another state in the U U.S. But there, there's that excitement. It's just this land of possibilities, uh, a tremendous, yeah. tremendous land of possibilities. So, yeah. Those those sensibility. I mean, you mentioned the word sensibilities, uh, and and that. What what are uh, the sensibilities? I mean, for you personally, you not only do you live in LA, you were born and raised in Los Angeles. So, um, do, how does LA influence your sensibilities as a, a person or a writer? I'd say. As you mentioned, there's the diversity of the people as well as of the landscape, the deserts, the canyons, the ocean, and the city all so close together, which is one of the wonderful things. Also, though, I like to define it, if I had to put it in one single image, I go back to that uh, pink smog sunset, which appears in a lot of my work. It a t sort of a toxic beauty it's also the oleanders you know it's it there's beauty and there's a toxicity or a darkness in the light and a light in the darkness that has been very attractive to me and interesting and inspiring to me i would say so how and when do you uh, where how and where do you write <laughs> so i have two kids who are now 20 and 22 and it's a little different but my writing space my desk has always been in the middle of my house with dogs and children running all around no quiet time no doors that close uh, I, I was a single mom since they were two and four I was able to do this I I don't recommend it necessarily uh, but there's a flow between my writing and my daily life that sort of always existed and I'm able to move between them I feel fortunate to do that I would love to be able to go in a dark room with headphones and just completely drop in but it's never been realistic so that's how I've done it and uh, sometimes I'll go to cafes or whatever but I don't have any real ritual maybe I'll light a candle but uh, it's really about keeping the work in my mind and uh, moving back into it and out of it in a fluid way if, as much as I can. So it's so. incubating in your head, even as yeah. you do other things. That's really, I'm glad you said that, because I think I, I really think that's how a lot of writing gets done. It's kind of carry, you carry it around with you. It incubates 
and it eventually sprouts. It just, yeah, that's it, a great it, word. And I was wondering if, if you hear that from many of the authors, that there is that sort of uh, constant ha- carrying it, even if you're not. I don't, don't have I don't hear that from, mm-hmm. from uh, the writers that I, mm-hmm. I talk to, and I'm surprised I don't, but I love the word incubate for one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or gestate, you know, uh, when you think mm-hmm. of a baby in the womb or, or a baby, mm-hmm. a newborn baby. And but the uh, or you think of incubators. I mean, in 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 business, they talk about incubators for growing young companies, mm. this sort of thing. And then there's I believe if I have this right, Ernest Hemingway was always one to say you you stop writing and you put it out of your mind. You just go, and now he was a guy who had a lot of other things on his mind, right. not like, like bullfighting and drinking and womanizing right. and brawling. Right. So maybe it was easy for him to put out of his mind, but he liked to come back to it fresh, is my understanding, and and just during that writing time, that's when you write, and it, he actually felt like it It made it, you, you took something away, it subtracted from your effort, when you kept carrying it around with you, but that's mm, not, that has not been my experience. I, and obviously it's not your experience either. The only time I can sort of escape it was, is when I'm doing something extremely physical. Like I, I need to do a lot of movement. Otherwise I, I am just too obsessed with it. So if I'm dancing or hiking or just moving in some way that, that will balance that. But otherwise it's pretty much, I do wake up in the middle of the night with the, the characters in my head talking or doing whatever. So oh, wow. I don't know if that's good, but <laughs> that's, that's powerful. That's powerful. So before we get to your characters taking on this life of their own and telling you what to do, shoving you out of bed, um, <laughs> what, uh, what kind of dance do you do? I mean, in my own head, I think of you being, you're very hip, I think of you being like the the young Madonna before when she was a free form dancer. That's when I really loved Madonna. Then she went into all this total choreography. It's almost like the difference between strictly outlining a book and making a super plot heavy versus (laughs) allowing it to be more organic, working with a very light uh, plot and allowing freedom of movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you that kind of dancer or do you, are you yeah. more form- you are okay yes i mean i studied a little you know i studied more formally when i was younger but i my favorite is is just free form dancing and just expression of the music so and i think that's similar to how i work in my writing i certainly have studied craft more than i've studied dance technique <laughs> a lot more but i have studied a lot of craft but a lot of my work is also very intuitive and i try to blend the two things so let me ask you, if you were to identify a composition, a rock song that is your signature, in other words, it's basically kind of embodies who you are as a writer, and you're going to take, take one song to do this. Because you remember, Blunt Edge Rock Lyrics is one of what one of the reviewers said about part of what you bring to your book. So I, I assume you love rock music, maybe rock jazz fusion, may, maybe all music. But what uh, song would you say is a signature. Oh boy, that's a really what, what hard. Would, what would be the first sound on the song on the soundtrack, the the Francesca Leah Block soundtrack that's about uh, you? I would say it might be Lust for Life by Iggy Pop or Dancing Barefoot by Patti Smith minus the heroine. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You picked two, two really legendary and out there artists. Yeah, I love both of them. So I read. Sure. Uh, did you read Patty Smith's uh, "Just Kids"? Yeah, uh, but, I love. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, I, I loved it too. You know, I I got the audio version of it because she reads it. And, oh, I have to um, that. Yeah, and I got to tell you, the thing I said to my wife because she, I was telling her about it, and and then she started to get interested. And I said, the thing is, she's so non-judgmental. She talks about yeah. these things, these people who don't necessarily do good things, uh, people who even hurt her in life, but there's no judgment there. It's just, it's very um, non-dualistic in that way. She uh, is almost kind of like the observer. This is my life going on and all I'm doing is observing. I'm not passing judgment on it. It's happened because it it happened for a reason and I don't know what that reason is. So I just accept. Yes, and it's so interesting because I heard her talk about writing 
creative nonfiction or memoir and how she feels very strongly about not throwing anyone under the bus about being really positive and I, I which is different than some uh, people might advise when you're writing memoir so I thought it was really interesting how she did that and yet still the story was so riveting she didn't need to do that it was very powerful yeah what an amazing I, I couldn't believe the number of people she brushed uh, elbows with people like Janis Joplin and uh, just on and on that list went and and I didn't realize that she had been so close to I mean Janis Joplin was just in passing but that she had um, was was present with so many of these legendary yes. music people, artists, and so on. It was really a, a, an, an amazing account of her life. And that time in New York, right? That creative, powerful time in New York. Yeah. So what, Living hand I, to I, mouth. Oh, hand to mouth with, with yes. Robert Maplethorpe. Yes, yes. And I, re I love this part where she talked about uh, not being a singer and going to do her poetry, and then it be it evolved into that. So so cool. Yeah, exactly. She's an artist. Uh, I mean, she's she's a three hundred sixty degree artist. So um, it wouldn't surprise me anything artistic that she does. And she she hit a home run with that book. And I noticed that since she's written more stuff that I have not uh, gotten to yet. But um, let me ask you this, uh, Francesca: If you were a character in one of your own books uh, what two or three marks of distinction um, would define you do you know how when somebody a writer will often introduce yeah. a character and they'll say just two or three things little things and you and you immediately think i got the picture i got that mental picture it just fills them right out yes well i would say this is slightly longer answer i'll be try to be brief but in when i'm teaching craft i talk a lot about the character's gift and their flaw so the positive and the negative extreme of that and so i think that my positive traits which might be sensitivity empathy very creative are also related to anxiety a kind of more anxious state so i think my character would probably be both the you know both of those i'm putting the first three into one um, in in extreme, uh, and I think they are very related. And certainly, many people in my life who are this way, who have a lot of feeling and passion and sensitivity, can also be, you know, the darker side of that can be anxiety. So that's probably what I would do as a character, and that would hopefully give a little bit of possibility for the character to have an arc to become more peaceful, which has certainly been my. <laughs> journey or the attempt towards that to preserve the first elements and to kind of calm the anxiety at the same time. We'll see if I get there. I'm working on it. You know, um, when you described your writing style, how you write in the middle of basically the middle of the household with, with a lot of activity around you, it sounds as though you will just grab the moment to write. You don't necessarily have your writing time with like a, a block no. of two or four hours. And, and I recommend, if possible, that writers do that. And I also, in the past, I had more opportunity to do that. But, you know, for me, I, I've just, I, again, it wasn't really an option. So I found another way. But as you pointed out at the very beginning, writing is like breathing. So I'm going to do it anyway. And I, I luckily have that drive. Um, it, yeah, so it's worked out. But it can be challenging sometimes. Is your anxiety associated with your writing? It's a funny question. I would say that the only area of my life that isn't as fraught with anxiety would be my writing, which is the Thorn Necklace, which is my craft book, is really about that. It's like I've, I've uh, lived my life feeling fairly confident around writing, and I want to help you, reader, with that. But I've also lived my life feeling much less confident about being a person in the world and so I can understand the feeling of anxiety or fear around writing that you may have and and that's sort of been my 
my journey that my it was instilled in me by my parents very young that I could write that I could publish that I would be could be successful and somehow I took that message in and I was supported in that and I like to help others in that way but some of the other messages didn't come across as strongly for various reasons so that's that's the journey that I'm on or how I'm trying to uh, I uh, identify with those feelings other people may have around the writing process. Now, why would your if, parents be telling you you can write? You're, you're, <laughs> you're, I mean, is that something that you said you want to be a writer and they supported you? Or did, or was it just kind of a part of them? Well, I, I'll end the question there and let you answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I know it's an interesting question. I think they, I always love to write, but I also drew and danced and other things. But I think, and my dad was a filmmaker and then a painter. Uh, my mom did a, a lot of different um, arts. Um, I think it was, they saw that I loved it. They saw I had some talents in it pretty early. And so they just fed that um, I think any other art form they would have also been supportive of but there was there was this idea somehow that I was going to be a poet and I it, I was never forced into anything for sure but I was I was supported and encouraged and so it, it you know I'm glad that I, I think they would have been open to other things they never pushed me in that way but they did give me that so were I'm your grateful parents, for it. were they artistic as well yeah yeah my dad uh, my dad was very successful in the film industry in uh, 40s and 50s and then um, left dur during the whole blacklisting time. Uh, and then he became a painter. He has paintings in the Hirshhorn Museum. Um, so he, he wrote scripts, so he did special effects. And my mom danced, wrote poetry. So it was always part of the environment growing oh, up. Yeah, yeah. So Francesca's an Italian name. Are you Italian? Yeah. No, no, I'm Jewish from New York, parents, Jewish from New York, uh, but they loved the, the name and also they, uh, you know, it was Piero della Francesca was part of the inspiration, the painter, because my dad loved his work. So, yeah, and they just, oh, also they just thought Francesca Lea sounded like a name of a poet, apparently. <laughs> So. Don't let us put you under any pressure, but we named you after a <laughs> <Yeah>. poet. <laughs> At least I wasn't named, you know, Christina Rossetti or something. Right. But I don't know. Emily Dickinson. <laughs> yes. So um, you are not anxious when you're writing. I mean, that's a time of peace right. when you're writing. But are you anxious away from the writing because you've got what you're writing in the incubator? You're carrying it around with you everywhere? Do you think that that creates some anxiety or are there other things going on? Uh, everything but that. <laughs> oh, everything but that. So the incubation yeah, will, period is good yeah. too. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. It's really more just, just that's the, I can escape whether I'm actually writing it or incubating, thinking about it. Those are both forms of escape from life, frankly, or the stresses of life, because a lot of what I pour into that is also life, but it's it's channeled through craft, through art, so it feels manageable to me, I think. So how do you um, treat anxiety? You can meditate, you could microdose on psilocybin, I suppose, you could be in therapy, you could um, um, do yoga. Uh, yeah. Do you have strategies for dealing yeah. with your anxiety? Oh, yeah. I, I would say, you know, for me, it's uh, difficult to sit still. So a lot of it is movement based. It's, the dancing is, is incredibly meditative for me. I do yoga. I do long walks. I talk a lot to my friends. You know, I've been in therapy much of my life, not currently. But, you know, I found I found a lot of strategies. Really, I had a therapist who passed away a couple years ago who was, you know, changed my life, really. So and I go to acupuncture, so I'm constantly, I kind of joke, you know, I'm kind of high, high maintenance. It's like a, an ongoing project, but I found <laughs> strategies that work. I just have to keep doing them all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. And and the writing, too, as I said, is, is a big part of that. That was like self-medication when I was little. Yeah, this is all interesting. So, um, do you... Do, do you hear... Go, go ahead, ahead, please. Go ahead. I was just going to 
ask you if that, another thing is if you hear this trait is something common in, in people who are creative or artistic that you speak to. You know, I, it doesn't necessarily come up in the conversation, but I mm -hmm. think it is very common. Well, I think anxiety is ex extremely common. I think that there's a lot of people who have anxiety who don't even recognize it as anxiety. Right. I mean, right. it's just very common. There's a lot to be anxious about these days. And um, we live such different lives now than than we used to live. And we've got so many things that come at us. And there's so much that is non-essential in life. And yet yeah. we make it kind of essential. We yeah. We place importance on stuff that is not necessarily essential. Yes, exactly. And and I think for the younger generation, they're just deluged with that. I know my kids struggle with it, just even the social media. So I think it, it has become more and more an issue and, and more important to find these things, these healing things that really do work, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So are you, uh, do you prefer to write fiction or nonfiction? fiction for sure i've written a little nonfiction, but i find it much more difficult i really like to create the world and the story more from from my imagination and i just i just find it easier i really admire people who write nonfiction, especially you know memoir creative nonfiction, or you know nonfiction that requires a lot of research because I do some research for my work, but not to that extent. And I think it's, it's a wonderful gift and skill. Now, do you um, have a different approach or attitude? It's certainly a different approach. I mean, there's, there's heavy research involved in nonfiction, but do you yes. have a different, bring a different writer's voice or attitude to uh, nonfiction versus fiction? Yes. I think that uh, I, I, it's more myopic and I, which is why maybe I, I don't like it as much for, to write. I like to read it, but like certainly just kids, I just ate it up. It was incredible. I, I think though to write it, like with House of Hearts, I was able to step out of myself in this character who's very, very different for me. She has, there are crossovers and similarities, but she's really different and, and it was freeing even though her emotional journey was symbolically something I was going through at the time, which is always the case. Now, memoir is very popular these days and have you written a memoir? Yes, yeah, so House of Hearts, the craft sorry, <laughs> it's on my mind. Thor the Thor necklace my titles all sound the same to me, actually. <laughs> the Thor necklace is both craft and memoir. And then I wrote Guarding the Moon, which was my first year as a mom of my daughter. Those are the two. What, then do, I have some, what do you mean both two. craft and memoir? Um, so the Thor necklace combines very specific craft lessons that I have developed over my career that I use with my students and it's interspersed it's sort of the interstitial material to the, the memoir, uh, my writing journey and the elements that have helped me on my writing journey. So it's organized in terms of finding a muse, finding a mentor, facing your demons, each of those chapters, which are uh, basically stories from my life are interspersed with a craft element that relates to them in some way. Now, there is a trend these days where people, basically they write a memoir, but they call it a novel. Um, a yeah. great example, which I really enjoyed, was, was Homeland Elegy. Not to, be, mm. not to be confused with Hillbilly Elegy. This is Homeland Elegy written by, I can't remember his name, but he's a Arab or Persian uh, Islamic writer. He's, but he's totally Americanized. He lives here in the United States. He's, mm -hmm. he, he's an American, clearly a memoir, but, um, and I'm sure it gave him the freedom by, by uh, promoting it as a novel, getting it published yeah. as a novel, gave him the freedom to fill in the spaces and ways that he wanted to and create messaging that he wanted to create. Have you read that one? I haven't read that one, but I'm really interested in, I guess, autofiction is a term that they're using exactly. a lot now. Exactly, right? autofiction. Like Carl, uh, oh God, what's his name? I, He's the Norwegian or Scandinavian yes. writer. He writes these, these big, not big books, uh, yes. just going on about all kinds of things in life. It, it seems like such freedom to do it that way. Yes, I, I think that, you know, there's there are elements of that in, 
many of my books, but I've never fully committed to that. And I, I think it's it, what I love about it is it kind of challenges this false idea that we're writing fiction entirely making something up when it's clear that we're using our life experience under that and so there are different degrees of that but in in the current thing i'm working on now i use magical realism or surrealism to change it a lot but otherwise the story is is exactly my life right in the last two years so i think it's it's kind of a fun Thing to consider, you know, where's the line between and how is it going to be marked as genre or sold or um, branded, marketed, all those things. Well, you make a good point that the people write fiction that's not entirely fiction, of course, and there are people who tell me, oh, I never read fiction, it's because it's made up and it's kind of like... Right. You know, I, I have to tell you, there's there's an awful lot of nonfiction in fiction. And there's a lot of fiction in nonfiction. People, I yeah. said, you, all you have to do is read a pre presidential memoir and <laughs> see that, geez, they, they did a good job sanitizing their record. Right, right. So it's kind of crazy that way. The other thing about the memoir is it seems, uh, or even a biography for that matter, because uh, I enjoy biographies and autobiographies as well. Mm -hmm. And the the kind of consistent voice that carries the reader from the start of the book to the end of the book it's like a companion the whole way rather than mm -hmm. jumping from character to character although i love those you know uh, traditional mm -hmm. novels as well but does that inform you at all just in terms if you're writing a novel uh that maybe because that seems to be such a kind of the prevailing attitude among readers is i want somebody to just tell me the story hold my hand carry me through the whole thing do you are you influenced by that at all, or do you come to the page just kind of like whatever's in me is going to come out of me? So you're talking about voice, I think. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Well, also just kind of the the, the writing side. I mean, you can write in first person, and it's your voice from beginning to end. And especially yes. if you don't introduce too many characters and have too many create yes. too many tributaries and all that. So I almost always write in first or close third. I've never tried. Um, omniscient. I've done some short stories in second person. I I feel more comfortable with w one psyche. I also have moved between two first person or two close third, but I admire certainly the omniscient point of view and what it symbolizes too about being able to to move around to a lot of different minds i think though overall what i say about voice to my students is to allow the natural voice to come out after you've read a lot um or while you are reading a lot which is ongoing while you are writing a lot while you are living a lot and experiencing things to let that natural voice come out and then look at that voice after you've kind of feel more confident with where the story's going and decide but maybe not at the very end, right, of the draft, and then decide what is strong about this voice and what do I need to strengthen. And sometimes the voice can, you know, completely make or break the story. So I I have changed the point of view, for example, halfway through, realizing it didn't work. Usually, though, it's pretty intuitive. And then later I apply sort of the craft questions. And, and the question that you asked, which is really good, is like, where does the reader need more hand-holding to understand what I'm trying to get across as opposed to this kind of distant um, or very poetic modernist kind of technique of just showing instead of telling anywhere, you know? Yeah, talk about it's, your voice. Uh, yeah. Give me some adjectives that you would use to describe your writer's voice. Uh, I would say, hopefully... Uh, lyrical, uh, from poetry background, um, I, uh, that's funny, I'm drawing a blank, I would say lyrical, but also with a, of an, an edge, um, and very imagistic, uh, hopefully emotional, and hopefully somewhat, um, controlled as i've gotten older 
I've learned more about that. I think in the beginning, I had a lot of free range. Just I was published very young, and my editors were like, "Do whatever you want. Here's another contract." <laughs> this is in the nineties, <laughs> you know. So I just was all over the place. But since I've, you know, really studied craft, taught craft, gone back to school for my MFA, I'm much more conscious of the diction, the syntax, the imagery you know, the emotional beats, all those things, and the plot beats, frankly, too. You know, uh, I think that oftentimes writers, their first novel is has a freedom about it that the others don't. I mean, you take a look at William Kennedy. Okay, he won <laughs> the Pulitzer for Ironweed, which was <clears throat> a good book, but his first book called The Ink Truck was, was just flamboyant. It was fast-paced. It was... You know, colorful characters, and along the way, he became more and more formal. And yeah. I liked him being freewheeling. I liked him <laughs> yeah. with the more outrageous characters. That's funny because my first book, I was so young. I was, you know, twenty four when I finished it. I I wrote it just for myself, for my friends. I didn't have any intentions of publishing that one. I had intentions of publishing other things, but. Anyway, and that book, of course, is the one, and it has no, pl I mean, the, it's very episodic, there's no real build of plot, the language is very simple, it's very short, but for, but for whatever reason, people, you know, still come up to me and ask me about that book, so, and it's the one that's been optioned the most times by far for film and TV, so, but I, for me, it's something I feel I've outgrown, but there was a lot of love and enthusiasm and excitement behind that that first book because I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I I had a love letter that I wanted to share, you know, and I still feel that way with my writing. But it was quite pure, I guess, at the time. Well, because you didn't know the rules, it they didn't constrain you. Right, right. And which book no, the, was this? Which which one? This is Weetsy Bat, which is part of the Dangerous Angel series, which is being optioned for a TV show right now by Sarah Gamble, who has the show You on Netflix, or developed, I should say. Uh, yeah, so it's been a long process with that over many years. And again, I've learned so much since then. But I also, I, I, I did learn a lot about modernist poetry as I was writing it or so right before. So those principles are in there, I would say. But as far as plot or all the things I now apply to my work, character development, you know, so many things it, I really did. I really didn't know, except for what I had just read. And my parents were always giving me books and reading me books and sharing mythology and fairy tales. So I learned a lot that way, too. Sounds like there's a lesson in that for your students as well. I mean, do you encourage your students to be to let the wild horses run free, or do you say yeah. no, no, no? You got to put a bra you got to put a bit in the mouth, and you got to put a saddle on them because yeah. uh, you can't just let yourself run free. We've got. I let them. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. I, I I want them to run free uh, as that's the basis of it and then as they're ready or as i interpret them to be ready or as they tell me they're ready we will start you know adding in more craft i usually i have a class that i teach called healing through writing which is very basic craft lessons based on personal experience that then they take, write the fiction from them but the craft it's very broad and then as we move on or in some of my other classes i start getting more in the weeds with the all those other things like screenplay beats sort of to to help with the plot or uh, looking at sentence by sentence and punctuation and every little detail i don't start them out like that i want i want them to feel that they have something precious in their minds in their hearts that they need to share they wouldn't be coming to take a class on a sunday afternoon on zoom you know and and so i want them to use that passion or that you know feeling inside to 
tell whatever story they need to tell starting there. It's really important. So maybe the first draft, it's uh, wild horses yeah. run free, and then we start yeah. applying. Yeah, now you start worrying about punctuation and spelling and all. I mean, obviously, that needs to be right, even if they did just say, hey, the first draft, the wildness, the, the wind blowing through my hair, that's what I want. <laughs> but you got to get the, you know, the, gram, the punctuation correct and all right. that. Right, yeah. But yes. then you're that. applying yeah. craft. At, you're, you're saying apply the craft to that and, and start of winnowing down your excesses and yes. so on. Now, uh, to our listeners, if you are thinking you want to reach out to Francesca Leah Block, maybe attend one of her classes, maybe get individual instruction from her because she does that as well. Her website URL is in, it's in the episode notes. I always do that with any author that's on, put there so you can uh, reach out to her. I want to talk to you more about your teaching method, but first I'd like you to read from one of your books. Oh, great. Uh, Thank which you. One, which one are you going to read from? And tell us which, which book you're reading, going to read from and just kind of set up uh, the, the excerpt you're going to read. Okay, so thank you. This is from House of Hearts, which just came out in July from Rare Bird, and it is set in the Salton Sea area of the desert. Uh, this is a, an excerpt pretty, you know, about page 21 it is. And this is um, just when the protagonist, Izzy, and her boyfriend, Cyrus, are together. Uh, before, this isn't really a spoiler because it's on the cover, uh, before he, he will disappear um, overnight. So it's just a short passage about them together in their shack that they've built out in the Salton Sea area. After the trick-or-treaters were gone, the candles and smudge stick burned out. Izzy and Cyrus lay on the futon, her head on the hill of his chest, his hands in her river of hair, the rush in a storm drain after a drought. Yard, Izzy's three-legged rescue tortoise, kept watch with somnolent eyes. She had read that you couldn't pick up a tortoise in the wild. So when she'd found Yard, she'd contacted Animal Rescue, and they'd come to get him. Once he'd been treated, she officially adopted him and called him Yard because of his three feet. It still made Cyrus laugh whenever she said the name. The waning gibbous moon lay vanquished by clouds, and the shack hunkered far enough from the highway that no lights shone in through the repurposed windows. Only cold burned the glass. In the morning, there would be jackrabbits and roadrunners and maybe a coyote or a deer, as he thought. Maybe if their love magic was strong enough and the clouds gave way in the night, there'd be rain. Maybe a rainbow. But now there was only silence and the creature comforts of each other's bodies. He kissed her deep, a lotus opened within. Nalumbo nucifera, water lily. Its seeds lived for years, she'd read, up to 1,300 years. She found herself thinking of Nephi's belly in the white tank top the other day, her fuller breasts. It was possible that Cyrus had noticed, but it was hard to tell behind his sunglasses. No, Izzy told herself, Cyrus never really looked at other women that way. He only looked that way at Izzy, and usually when they were alone. Let's have a baby, Izzy blurted. Most of the time she repressed the thought, but it was as if the beating of her heart had forced the words out of her. No, baby, he said, voice firm, and reached for a condom. Ever since the miscarriage years ago, he avoided the subject when she brought it up. There was a list of reasons why he didn't want a child. The early loss, their finances, the salt and sea, the state of the world. Sometimes she wondered if it had mostly to do with their own broken pasts, some perception of her as unstable, unfit to be a mother, but he never admitted to this. Tonight, though, she couldn't contain herself. Please, baby, she whispered, feeling again the pull of her womb. His eyes swam away from her like two dark fish. We got to get out of here before we even consider it, Is he said with finality. 
They'd been saving to move to Los Angeles and were getting close. It would be a new start, a real escape from their parents and the sea shored with bones. A better place to raise a child, too, though he hadn't made any promises about this. Maybe she could apply to UCLA again, he'd suggested. It wasn't too late. She'd gotten a full ride scholarship, but hadn't taken it, hadn't wanted to leave Cyrus. One night, just before the call of sleep enveloped him, he'd said, you'll do massage and I'll work construction while we go to school and we'll save up and eventually get a little house, hike and read on our days off, go to libraries and estate sales and see bands, learn to surf, to swim, she'd laughed. Desert child to the bone, she'd never learned. You know, I hear... I, and I realize it's a small excerpt, but I hear hints of two authors, Anne Rice mm. and Tom Robbins. Interesting, interesting. That, that's, Are there I, people I sort, you've read at all? I read a lot of Anne Rice when I was younger, and a, just a little of his work, not too much. Um, I, what I was reading a lot with this book was a, a lot of Gothic writers. I might have mentioned... Um, Shirley Jackson, the Bronte sisters, uh, also Joy Williams, who's not really gothic, but more contemporary. Um, so I think it was sort of, I'd like to call it Southern California Gothic, this book. <laughs> and Anne Rice, certainly. So you were right on with that. Have you uh, read the uh, Shirley Jackson's biography? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you know what? The other one that came out uh, recently, big book, is called Red Comet, and it's about uh, Sylvia Plath. Oh, I must read that. Oh, amazing. It's big, and it is agonizing because you know the ending, but it goes yeah. on and on, and not in a bad way. Not in a bad oh. way. You you just suffer with her. You suffer yeah. through the through that account uh, with yeah. her. Heather Clark wrote the uh, mm. biography, and it's oh, not I... the only one that she, that I mean, it's not the only one about Sylvia Plath, but I think it's being considered kind of the definitive one. I may, might be wrong about that, but... Mm, amazing. That sounds so good. I love her. Her work was hugely influential for me when I was younger, especially. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, something about her that I think might apply to you is um, she was an androgynous writer, I thought. She had a mm. lot of male um, energy in her uh, mm. writing. And I, I hear that in your writing as well. Not necessarily that's, that's this excerpt as much as yeah, yeah. some other stuff that I've read. Is yeah. that, would you? Am I just catching snatches of this and it's really not uh, no, uh, on I, point? Well, I think that's so interesting because to me, I'm, I'm so sort of steeped in the feminine, but I, I have been told that some of my depictions of women seem like they've... <laughs> I don't know if this is a good thing. I mean, I, I, there are certain... Um, obsessiveness in my description of some of the physical detail, and I don't mean just bodies, but even like the clothing or whatever, that that my, like my professor in school said, I couldn't get away with describing that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Your motel book, uh, what is it called? Yeah. The, the... Beyond, Beyond the Pale Motel. And I was listening to some audio clip of that from <laughs> Audible, and I'm thinking, I couldn't do this because I would no. be seen as just a horny white male writer, <laughs> but you can get away with it. I can get away with it. Yeah. yeah. No, I and I, I, I love it because it's it's that kind of, uh, and that's part of what I mean about being androgynous, that you, mm -hmm. that you, you've got a very sexualized voice, at least at times you, mm -hmm. you feel yeah. free to express that. And, uh, and that used to be pretty much allowable, but nowadays if you're a male writer, uh, I mean, my God, they crucified oh, Philip Roth. I mean, he the guy oh, yeah. was excellent. He was an outstanding yeah. writer. They crucified him. Norman Mailer yeah. got crucified. Norman yeah. Mailer was a jackass in a lot of ways, so he probably deserved some crucifixion. <laughs> but, but not so much about about uh, writing about women, because I think both of those guys adored women. Um, yes. It's a, it is a double standard, I think, and I think certainly the I, I ha, this I'll also give credit to my parents as far as feeling uh, a lot of freedom to express myself around that topic. So, and it just to me, it's just another part of life, and so I I, I almost always have some elements of that in my work. Um, 
And well, I love I, it, and I encourage it. I think uh -huh. I think you're a terrific writer, and that piece you just read um, has got that kind of uh, those magical elements to it. That kind of I don't know whether any would you consider any of what you just read to be magical realism or surrealism, or mm -hmm. was that just kind of straight ahead? Interesting. So I love magical realism, but and this book ha could be interpreted as that. I tried to write this book very consciously as as you could read it either as straight literary fiction realism with some strange elements, or there is a clear magical realist piece, and we're not sure. And that's the balance that I tried to get, which is maybe one reason it took me a long time to write this book. I really wanted to for readers to be able to interpret it either way. So I, I think those are my favorite books that kind of walk that line, I, I would say. You know, the other, uh, the novel that popped to mind, I mentioned Anne Rice and Tom Robbins, but the actual book that popped to mind while you were reading that is, um, it'll come to me here. Oh, The Witches of Eastwick by oh. John Updike. Yeah, yes, definitely. Which is that. a beautiful I, book. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, yeah. especially the first half of the book. The first half of the book mm -hmm. is, it's worth, if anybody out there who has not read the book, it's worth getting the book just to read the first half. I mean, it definitely yeah. drops off after that, but that first half is like a celebration. Yes, that's a great way to describe it. Yeah, I love that book. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that that mix of the of the magic and the real, the strange, the surreal, you know, that's always really intrigued me. And some of my favorite works that I read is that. So. Talk about your teaching methods, because there are people who say you can't really teach writing. It's one of those things, either a person has got it or they don't. You can encourage it, no doubt. And, mm -hmm. uh, but talk about your teaching methods that when in the classroom, let's, let's, because there's, it's totally different teaching a group, I suspect from teaching an individual or, or maybe you're, actually working with them on a particular piece of work and helping them through it. Uh, what kind of, um, what are some of the fundamentals of teaching writing to your students? Mm. So I, I find, I actually do believe you can teach writing. Uh, I think the only thing you can't teach, 100% can't teach is the desire. If somebody comes to me and I recognize the look, because I've seen it so often in these years, with this look in their eye, I have a story. I want to tell it. I don't know if I can tell it. I don't know if I can do it, but I want to. I'm coming to you, this stranger, giving you some money and saying, please help me. Then I know I can help them. I always can help them. I think they're, you know, if you have to have the, the somewhat burning feeling or or maybe burning is too strong, but that, that helps. And then from there... And usually I teach similarly, of course, it's more in-depth with the individual privates, but in, even in the group classes, I'll try to really zero in on what it is that person wants and needs, what their goals are, what their challenges are. We talk about that in the first class, and we really look closely at the, the pages, the words on the page, as well as the bigger picture of the story, and I try to custom customize it to whatever they are telling me they need and what I intuit they need and where I can push them. So it's a very personal and complex process, but I feel quite confident after doing it this long and, and also just writing for this long and going back to school that whoever comes to me, if you have that feeling that we can strengthen the work and even make it ready for the world. I'm not going to promise publication because in this climate it's so difficult, but I certainly think that it, there are ways to find an audience for it uh, after it's strong enough and that I can help make it strong enough. What are the biggest issues that you see with writers who are working on novels or they're or trying to be short mm -hmm. story writers? What, what are the biggest issues that, uh, that kind of bring them up short? Mm, great question. I think a lot of my students come to me really with wonderful voices. There are always things we can strengthen, like are the verbs active? Are you over-relying on adverbs, et cetera, whatever. But I think the things that lately especially have been coming up over and over again is how to, not just how to structure it, because I'm pretty good with able to help with that, but how to structure different time, how to weave timelines 
So a lot of people want to tell backstory or two concurrent timelines, and it's about blending those together and finding a way to do that. And that comes up a lot. Sort of the pace of the story and the order of the events of the story, especially if the story takes place over a longer period of time. So that's something that at least maybe it's cyclical, but lately that's the one that's coming up for all for many, many of my students. Why do people uh, overuse adverbs so often? Uh, what is it about adverbs? I think we're just unconscious. We, we just um, throw them in without thinking and, and we're sort of programmed to use them. But what makes them in, what makes them problematic is they are so overused and they don't show they they make the verb more passive they over explain so sometimes either removing them and making the verb stronger or putting in an adverb that contrasts with the verb rather than defines it in a way we've seen over and over again i think that that's the issue and the other one that i struggle against this quote rule is adjectives because i love love me my adjectives and (laughs) when i first poetry class my poetry teacher like nope take out of all the adjectives. No, they're beautiful. But his point was, and I still use them as you can see, but his point was that if you use an adjective, we, the reader can't imagine for themselves. And if you use too many, then it becomes blur, blurrier and blurrier. So somehow trying to really rely on those concrete nouns and those strong verbs can, can strengthen the work. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting point that instructor makes because that's that's and I, I know I've said this on the podcast before that you know when you read your imagination is engaged you're kind of a co-creator yeah. along with the author but when you're watching television or a movie or a streaming series the director makes all the decisions and you're just passive and watching you you're not yeah. allowed to create the character in tandem with Francesca Leah Block because she uses too many adjectives her instructor already right. said that. I'm kidding right. they're not using too many but uh, sometimes I- I still do. <laughs> it's it's obviously a consideration there. He makes a he makes a really good point because I love yeah. adjectives too, and it's so yeah. easy to overuse them because we have such a beautiful language. We have so many yeah. options, and it's it's a beautiful exactly. language with so many options. So, uh, what you, what are you working on now, Francesca? So I'm working on um, something that's very different from House of Hearts. It's called Love Six, spelled L-U-V bracket S-I-C with the little grammar pun there. Um, <laughs> And it's about a woman who is dating during a pandemic with um, and tormented by her best friend who may or may not be real. It's um, kind of, uh, I like to say it's fight club with women and dating and grammar. So it's very strange. I'm What I'm doing with this book is really playing with humor because humor to me is such a gift when when people can do it well and I love to you know read it and it's hard to write and so I'm trying to let myself kind of go crazy and just write what I think is funny and interesting and extreme and hopefully it'll work and it's kind of a change from House of Hearts where I think there are maybe three funny moments and they're all around the animals in the book and so this one I'm hoping is you know has a little bit more of that. So what stage is it at right now? Uh, it's it's slow. This book is slow. It's at, um, it's about, well, I have a beginning, middle, and end, but it's missing a lot of material, and there's a new piece I have to put in. So it's it's going slowly, and it's rough, but it's um, I, I do have a, a sense of the big picture, and we'll see if I can get there and not you know, uh, be too distracted by all the other things going on. But yeah, it'll, well, it'll, we'll be the next book. What does it say to you when it's going slowly? Does that mean that, Hey, mm. maybe I'm writing, maybe I shouldn't be writing this or, mm. or is it, I mean, has, has your best work come quickly to you or has it been, um, laborious? Great question. And both. So I think in the beginning, some books have just written themselves practically, but the last book, which I'm the most proud of, frankly, took years and a lot of rev- revision. I think the reason this other book is going so slowly is I'm still living it. So I can't quite, I'm, I think each book is kind of a, 
personal journey or a lesson that my psyche is trying to teach me. So if I'm writing about something that's currently happening in my life, it's more difficult to have any perspective. And I think that's what is, I do think it's the story I need to tell now very much so, but it might take a little longer to figure out, you know, what the story really is. And I think both, both, types of writing both the books the stories that you feel like you're channeling which is a blessed state and the stories that are real struggles and take years they're both valuable in different ways and they're both you know worth worth pursuing or the second one is still worth pursuing it just can take longer and you might need more insight from people around you maybe to help so um final question uh if you weren't doing what you're doing if you had to reinvent yourself, I know if you stopped writing, you'd suffocate. But <laughs> let's just say you realize, well, I won't suffocate. I, I can survive it. What would yeah. you choose to do? Well, do I have unlimited resources? <laughs> uh, if you would like. Uh, it's your, you, you, I would like that. Your magic, use your magical realism yeah. to create it. Uh, yeah. No, you know what I would do? I would produce films. That's what I would do. I, I have been, you know... A producer my whole life in some ways not a, a literally a film but um my career i've done it all through my home all through my connections all with very with no budget um and just connecting people and creating projects and coming up with new ideas so that is my fantasy to you know there's so much great material that i would love to develop into film tv i know so many talented people and i'm working slowly to move in that direction i do want to keep writing or writing scripts too but i think the as i get older i want to bring up other people and and help them get their world at work out there and uh through either that and, and of course publishing too i i'm starting a journal on my website as well with some of my student work and colleagues work so it's more about being in that producer role or editor role as opposed to just dragging up more stories from my psyche as well instead trying to help other people especially more marginalized people have the opportunity to tell the story and get the story out into the world so is that what your body of work as a movie producer would be populated by uh, movies that that um, shine a spotlight on the needy on the overlooked on the how would you characterize the kinds of movies you would want to bring to to the screen i think it's a combination of an amazing story and a story that also provides some form of healing or um you know um uh putting somebody in a, in a place in a position where they can be seen where they can be heard somebody who hasn't been seen and heard which i think in itself is about healing and of course anything that can bring more healing to this world i think uh these storytelling is a, a great way to start especially if you can give it to the you know people who need it who need to tell that story and be heard and seen name a movie you wish you had made that fits that that uh, uh, idiom oh wow um you know i'm just gonna say a movie that's a lesser known movie but i love it it's called tigers are not afraid um it's magical realism it's a female a mexican director a woman i'm blanking on her name i have to look it up um and um it deals with you know uh drug trade in mexico and it is incredibly beautiful uh, and incredibly powerful sociologically as well. Wow. wow. Yeah. Are you looking her name up right now? Yeah, let me do that. Um, Let's give her some credit. Give her some props yeah, here, please. right? Yes. Isa. Isa Lopez. Isa Lopez. Yeah. Tigers Are Not yeah. Afraid is the name of yes, the film. Yes, thank you. Film. Wow. Francesca Leah Block has been our guest. Uh, Francesca, this has been really fun. You are really an interesting person, and um, you, you sound like you've lived a very free life. Uh, like I said, I'm envious that you produce so much work at such an early age. I don't even know how old you are, but I can tell from your picture you've got a lot of mileage ahead of you. So um, thank you for coming on the program and sharing uh, all that is best about the world of writing, the writing life. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you so much, Mike. Your questions were amazing. I really appreciate it so much.